and where every procedure is subjected to some kind of trial to compare with not giving the procedure to see what actually happens. Uh, but, and we're dealing in prison with some pretty drastic procedures, have major effects on people, yet they've never been researched. Is that right? No. It's, uh, I, I think it's indefensible. One man's experiences on the ghost train may soon come to haunt the Home Office. Andy Cunningham is suing them over the treatment he received when he was shipped out of Parkhurst Prison. After a dispute over a family visit, Cunningham, serving an eight-year sentence for robbery, assaulted a prison officer, emptying a slop bucket over him. He went through the usual disciplinary procedures, but that wasn't all. I was taken to the segregation unit in Parkhurst Prison, and, um... About two, three hours later, I was transferred to Camp Hill Prison. At Camp Hill, he found himself in a strip cell on the punishment block. I was told that what happened in the other prison, they didn't want to know about that. The following day, I was being moved to another prison. Um, so I went to sleep that night. The next morning, at about seven o'clock, half seven, the door opened and... Um, a nose pipe was put on me, cold water was sprayed over me, and I was, I was asleep at the time. About two hours later, the door opened again, and about eight screws came in, just started hitting me with the truncheons and booting me. I put my arm up, and one of them went to hit me on the head. And uh, the result was it resulted in a broken arm. When I left the cell, I, I was semi-conscious. I tried moving the arm, but it was just, I was in terrible pain. I rang the bell, and, um, I've asked for a doctor, you know. And what did they say? Well, I was told that uh, when we're finished with you, it won't be a doctor you'll be needing, it'll be the undertaker, you know, which... Uh, what which, uh, Well, I was frightened at the time, you know, when I heard that. I mean, they can do what they want, can't they? In them places, when you're down a block and you're the only one now, I mean, you're in their hands, they can do what they want with you. An hour, two hours, and... Uh, I just all piled into the cell. I just piled on top of me and they just twisted my arm about what was broke when I was lying on the floor. They placed me in a body belt, which is um, it's a leather belt with a metal handcuff on each side. You can't move, you know, your arms are in a metal cuff each side of you. I had no clothes on at all. I was then carried out of the segregation unit and just thrown into the back of the transit van. I was just on the floor and they were sitting on top of me with their boats in me back, some of them, and just transferred to Pentonville Prison. But even after the 120-mile journey, his ordeal was not yet over. I was placed in a strip cell overnight, you know, which is a cell of absolutely nothing in it, you know. And the, uh, the body belt was left on me. That wasn't taken off until the following day. At nearby Whittington Hospital, it was confirmed his arm was broken. The rest of his sentence was served the hard way, moving from prison to prison 16 times, often straight into solitary confinement. Andy Cunningham is now suing the Home Office, who are denying the assault. Seven weeks ago, we asked the Home Secretary and the prison's minister to appear in this film. We were told... Ministers do not wish to take part. We also asked for permission to film in punishment blocks. We were refused. At every prison, this official declaration is on display. A commitment to treat prisoners with humanity. But in some of our prisons, the words and the reality may be far apart. That's what you could perhaps call in industry a mission statement. But as far as prisons are concerned, it's just a whitewash. It's nothing more than camouflage. Um, it's the image that the Home Office Prison Department likes to project to the public. But of course, the public, whilst they may see the visiting rooms and the outside of the prison gates where these signs are portrayed, don't see what actually goes on behind the closed prison doors of a punishment block. James Marcus Smith in Houston, Texas. He cut demo records for Elvis Presley. He chauffeured for Paul Newman. He dated Dean Martin's daughter. He's been bankrupt, bombed out, 
Now he's on his way back. Wood and Park Leyland may seem a strange place to meet PJ Proby. Then again, PJ is a strange guy. He's a man who's done it all, who's had everything and then lost it. I was a billionaire. Straight up? Mm. Three, three years of millions and millions of pounds. Where did it go, PJ? A lot of beautiful women. Um, a lot of boats and a lot of airplanes. Uh, Would I be right in thinking these were quite wild times? I'm a wild man. You looking at Steve Maproby. <laughs> How wild are you, PJ? So wild that you couldn't keep up with me on the golf course. <laughs> 31 Cunnery Meadow, Clayton Le Woods, isn't particularly wild, but it is the home of the man who's rediscovered PJ Proby and written a song for him, retired prison officer John Sutton. PJ Proby, 1964, Hold Me Somewhere Together, I apologise, probably the best singing voice in pop history. Where has he been for 21 years? I decided that we would find him again. We'd create a song about his life. He's been down, he fell on the stage of fools. This is it, the ultimate comeback. The biggest thing in pop history. The biggest thing in pop history may yet happen, but the chances are PJ will be best remembered as the man who split his pants on stage. Pants always split. Elvis's pants split. Well, I was banned for, for two years. And um, that was it. Ladies and gentlemen, PJ Proby! <laughs> In the 70s, PJ Proby eked out a living on the northern club circuit, even putting in an appearance at the wheel tappers. Now he says he's ready for the big time. The only question is the big time ready for him. Involved in the star's trajectory is burnout, a hazard for advertisers, managers, manufacturers, and above all for the star himself and burnout in sports or show business, two closely linked professions, can have catastrophic consequences for the star deprived of stardom. In the world of pop, no one knows that better than one outrageous chart topper of the 1960s, P.J. Proby. For those who still remember P.J. Proby, there was one significant moment to match Gascoigne's tears and Cooper's flooring of clay, but it led to his professional ruin. Promoters would no longer book him after he split his trousers on stage in Croydon in 1965. He lives now in Bolton, Lancashire. The young star from Texas who took Britain by storm is now a man of 52 living on social security, remembering his heyday. It felt like uh, a teenage romance, like, like when you go out with your first teenage girl. And it uh, felt like, um, uh, my God, you're going to make it. Did you ever think that it might go away? Never. I thought, uh, I thought, um, I thought that, uh, well, I actually went up to John Lennon and told him you're through. Thanks for giving me more time. Thanks for staying on my mind. And thanks for loving me. Thanks, thanks is a song he's recently recorded in a comeback attempt organized thanks by former prison officer John Sutton me. from his modest bungalow in Preston. Like others in show business and sport, Proby sought an age-old refuge from pressure and decline. I think when it all went wrong, PJ turned to booze. The booze took control, and for 21 years, PJ Proby's been living in a bottle of Jack Daniels. I've just caught that. I fitted him a new brain, and he's going back to the top. For the moment, he's going to Blackpool in a Rolls Royce sent by a businessman who's offering him the chance of a live stage comeback in Cabaret. Rolls-Royce living was once what he woke up to every day. It still is for some of those who made money from his talent before casting him aside. See you there. I've always thought I was a celebrity from the age of one year old. 
I think I've always been the most egotistical butthole that God put two feet on. See, because everything I did worked. I have never been a failure at anything. In Blackpool, Proby arrives for a business meeting at what may well be for him the last chance saloon. The owner of the Lansdowne Hotel, Bobby Hope, Anywhere wants there. him to do a season here in the spring, provided he can get himself together. Uh, where did I sign my name here? Yep. From a fallen star hoping for a comeback, some words on Gaza, whom he admires and wishes well. This is just a draft. He'll have to gain as much strength to cope with his success now that he did when he was tackled and when he cried. He'll need all that strength and, uh, and he'll have to sustain it. It won't be just one tackle now. It'll be the tackle of his life. This is a true story, a simple story about two men, their hopes and their dreams. The first man is called Hope, Bobby Hope, a singer in his own hotel. His dream is to make that hotel the hottest night spot in Blackpool. The other is called Smith. Jim Smith, and he lives in Bolton. His dream is to do one last big performance, then leave Britain forever. But James Marcus Smith, PJ Proby, has another name, Trouble. Legend show is about uh, the legends, the great legends. Nostalgia is the thing that's in at the moment. And we spent hours and hours trying to think of who would be a big enough legend that's alive, because if you think most of the legends are dead. I mean, Elvis is dead, Roy Orbison is dead, Del Shannon's dead. Uh, so we thought and thought and thought, and we came up with about like, three names. One was the Everly Brothers. Uh, the Everly Brothers wouldn't do it. The, the fee was far too high, and they didn't want to. They split up and fell out. Dusty Springfield was concentrated on recording, and she was only interested in a fortnight, and we wanted somebody for the season. And then we suddenly came across PJ Proby. <laughs> a bit of a wild one. I mean, we're talking about PJ, but he's like the Jerry Lee Lewis. I mean, uh, we do, we've got to have a minder with him sometimes. He is a bit of a wild fella. But he's a nice fella. When you get down to him, he really is a nice man. He's wild, but wild in a, a nice way. He'll pack the place because the public love him. The public want to see PJ Proby. And it might be the last chance. It might be the last chance they ever see him. Because I have told him, if he fluffs it this time, there's nobody will ever touch him again. My idea of buying this hotel was that I wanted a ballroom big enough to put star names on. That's always been my ambition, and that is what I wanted to do. So we're going to try to make this like Caesar's Palace has the Tom Jones. Uh, and if PJ can get it together, perhaps the Lansdowne uh, will be like the Las Vegas of Caesar's Palace with Tom Jones. They'll always remember that PJ Proby is on the Lansdowne. Uh, we've brought him to Blackpool, we've moved him out of Bolton, we've given him somebody to look after him. He does need to have close contact all the time um, because of his problems, the problems he's had through the times. He's an ex-superstar ex who's trying to make it again. He's basically a very lonely man. He spent a lot of time in the wilderness on his own. But uh, 
he's getting he's getting better every week. We can see improvement on him. Look at him walking, using his legs again. His legs were very very weak. Putting through different courses, make sure he eats correctly. You know, trying to cut his drinking though, which is looks okay. But um, he's coming together quite well. Oh, I just can't help believing. He's never been asked to help with the presentation of the show. So this time, he's helping with the show. This time, he's telling me what musicians he, he wants. And if they're not right, they'll be fighting until we get the right ones. I like Jesse. I don't know what else I could say about him. I like him. Elvis Presley went with my sister. Uh, she was going to marry him. Jesse, I hope, can make some kind of a place in the summer season, and and if he if he if he can outdo me, good on him. These two come from a dance school in Blackpool. They've worked for me all season, Jim, and when they wear the leather gear, they're brilliant. Yeah, I think putting these two on the show, Jim, and giving a bit of speciality. It's yeah. like they're not just girl dancers. But when they dress up in the John Travolta, all of the Newton John gear, yeah. do that. I too. had a hit with uh, Hold Me, and I started doing James Brown stuff because they weren't big here in, in England. So I, I thought to myself, well, why not do it before them because they're, they're going to be hits over here anyway. But when they are hits over here anyway, everybody's going to say they copied you. <laughs> and I was right. It worked. When, when they became big hits, they said, they're imitating P.J. Proby. <laughs> Bull corn. I was imitating them three years before they even got there. <laughs> but I think he'll do it, I've no doubt. Because everybody you speak to says he won't. This is the funny part about it. And everybody you speak to, everyone, not just one. Because everybody you speak to, whether they're in the business, whether they're singers, whether they're friends of his, and all his friends say they hope he does do it. They really don't want him not to do it, but they all say he just won't do it. When the time comes at the end of the line, he won't do it. He'll find some excuse to pull out. Rehearsal, rehearsal, rehearsal. Yeah, yeah. So I, don't, I, 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 I think the show is the best in Blackpool. I personally believe that this man is the greatest white singer this century. He's really got everything that Otis Redding had. He, he really produced some of the finest recordings of pop music in the last 30 years, I believe. He's another Elvis Presley, he's really got the business. So I set out to put that voice on record. Just a few months ago when I booked him, and during rehearsal, his control of the band, his professionalism in dealing with the musicians was outstanding. His voice was terrific. I booked him to play at Maxim's in Barrow, which was the local nightclub up in the north of England. And Phoebe appeared, and unfortunately I had pleurisy and couldn't get there. I'm holding on for a hero till the morning light. Eleven o'clock came, and of course we have to go up and he goes on stage. And, well, it, it wasn't right. Unfortunately, there was a series of events which went against him. and. Because of that, the night was not what it could have been. One in the morning, the guy running the club rings me. He said, we're having problems with PJ Kirby. I said, what do you mean problems? He said, well, it's been terrible. He's gone on stage, he's fallen off his stool twice, he can't remember the words of the songs. The band knew exactly every number they'd rehearsed during the day, and they knew when to come in, when to come in, when to... But he suddenly lost it, and he started to sing a song which was somewhere in the programme, but further on, of earlier, whatever. And the band were playing one number and he was singing another one. We got into the studio and he point-blank refused to sing. I mean, 
I spent money to get him to the studio. We, we'd hired the musicians. We've got the backing tracks. We've got everybody there. And when we got in the studio, Jimmy said, I've changed my mind. I'm not singing. The intro to first the act. First. Yeah. And then the man is here. Oh, no. Uh, wait a minute. I'm being rushed. Uh... When you want us to say the man is here. Before the intro, isn't it? Before the no, intro. No, no, wait, 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 please. No suggestions. Just before I go into home. That's that's after after the intro. After after uh I've uh, done Do You Know Who I Am? And just before home, you say, the money Ladies and gentlemen, the man is here. Boom! Home is This is PJ Proby. You can take him so far, and as soon as he feels that success is there, he opts out. He liked the song. Uh, as soon as he decided that he was going to play games with me, I decided that you, there's no way I'm, I'm accepting this. So I took the silly sod by the scruff of the neck and said, you're either going to sing for me, mate, or we're going to have to have words. He said, well, there's only one way you'll get me to sing. I said, that's if you hit me. <laughs> so uh, I, I just obliged him a little bit. I mean, we don't want to damage the product. <laughs> but having done that, uh, Jimmy said, right, well, if that's the score, I'll sing. On the road again. Going places that I have never been Seeing things that I might never see again And I can't wait to get on the road again On the road again Like a band of gypsies we go down the highway We're the best of friends Insisting that the world keeps turning our way and our way It's on that road again I can't wait to get on On that road again The life I love Is making music With my friends And I can't wait to get on On the road again Play it, son I don't think he's got a cat in hell's chance Chester Cupboards. No way. A million and one things can go wrong with him. It can be done, but he's got to be treated very sympathetically. I personally believe that come to the last minute, PJ probably will press the self-destruct button that he's got his finger on for the last 25 years. On the road again. Like a band of gypsies, we go down the highway. We're the best of friends, insisting that the world keeps turning our way. And our back. way is on the road again. I can't wait to get on that road again. The life I love is making music with my friends. I can't wait to get on the road again No, I can't wait to get on the road again No, I can't wait to get on the road again No, I can't wait to get on the road again Is uh, Hayden there? Hey, Giant. Uh, well, that's what I was calling you for. Yeah, he told me, he, uh, well, he didn't tell me I was sacked. He called uh, Elizabeth from London and told her I was sacked. And, yeah. I just wondered if you knew any more about it. Uh, you, you're gonna have to throw this on the on, on the floor. He just told me to fuck off. That'll have to be on the scrap floor. Uh, but it could have worked. 
could could have worked magnificently. The biggest show in Blackpool. Now he's not going to have any show. He's not training like he said he would do. Uh, he didn't go playing golf like he said he would do. He was called starting to go to the gym three or four times a week. I think he went about twice and give up. He said he was going to cut down on the drinking a little bit, which I don't think he has. He just got a little bit off struggles. I think it was nerves, really. Let's get one thing clear. Did he sack you or did you walk out or...? or... No, he sacked me. He sacked you. Yeah. And why did he say? What was his reason? He didn't give one. He didn't turn up for rehearsals twice. Uh, he had a little paddy whereby he went, went back to wanting him's 27-piece orchestra and six girls and all this lot. And we compromised on a five-piece with four girls. Uh, we got them all here and he never turned up. At four o'clock he was coming and he was never turned up. That happened twice where we had to pay all the musicians, so we uh, sent him back to Bolton. They were supposed to start on the 11th. Nothing. I was the only one that showed up. Then from that date uh, to, what was it, last Friday or something, uh, he had made my life such a misery that I got a terrible asthma attack. As you can see, all that junk down there. And, uh, and, uh, stress. And, uh, everything that we agreed on, off, off contract and on contract, he didn't live up to any of it. What are you gonna what are you gonna say to Jim when we get there? Just quietly talk to him. Like I said, see if he wants to do it. I mean, both me and Aiden think that he can do it, and he's a fool not for doing it. No matter going down there and saying this is it now. I mean, I've never been down there before. I mean, time's a lot of money to me. I've got a big hotel to run there, and a lot of business, and a lot of problems. So for me to spend a half a day to go down there to speak to him, he's got to realize that this is it now. It's turned into the Bob Hope show. And uh, it was supposed to be uh, a living legend show. Now, Bob Hope is not only not a living legend, uh, he is a struggling um, performer, which at his age, he's left too long, as far as I'm concerned. He's a fool to himself, really. Well, that's been PGA probably all his life, and at 53, how many more chances has he got? He can't have that many more, can he? I think he just thinks he's the man. He's the same man he was in 64 when he was big time. I mean, this is going to be his last chance, though. Well, I would think it's his last chance, because if he doesn't get it right this time, people are going to say, well, that's it. We don't want to know about him anymore at all. Don't you agree? And I don't think we could do any more for him. I mean, nobody pays money out for nothing, especially in this day and age where businesses and high interest rates, businesses are going bust, people losing their homes. It's hard times at the moment.